question is anyone expecting a talk from Bartosz? Sorry, we swapped. <laughs> I'll explain you in a second why we did that, but hopefully you guys will appreciate. Um, so I'm a crazy person, I'm not a mathematician. Uh, so what I'm gonna do today during this talk is that I'm gonna hopefully gonna you guys realize that you have been using category theory in your code and you didn't even know. Um, what is going to happen is that uh, after my introduction tomorrow at half past three, Bartos is going to give us a little, uh, a nice follow up on this talk and is actually going to talk about mathematical principles. Okay? Cool. So we can start. Um, don't worry too much about code. There is going to be a lot of it. But um, try to focus on the journey. All the code is on GitHub. So what I would like you to do is just to following the reasoning that we are gonna take, okay? Cool, so let's start with a really awesome quote. This quote is from Philip Walden, and um, he was talking last year at Lambda World. Uh, I put a link uh, to this talk. And he basically was saying that there is a clear mapping between logic and computer science, and that every good idea is discovered twice once by a mathematician, and once by a computer scientist, right? How cool is that? And that's what we're gonna do today. So I am the computer scientist, so I'll give you my take on category theory, and then tomorrow afternoon, Bartot is gonna give you another overview of what category can do, category theory can do, but obviously from a mathematician perspective point of view, okay? Sounds awesome? It does, come on guys. Cool, um, so, hi guys. I'm an ex-Java developer. I know most of us are ex-Java developers. And when I started working with Scala, um, the biggest problem that I had is that there were a lot of concepts that weren't really familiar to me. So when I was at uni, it was just object-oriented programming. Functional programming didn't exist at all. There was a Lambda course, a Lambda calculus course, but the teacher was tough at grading. It was optional, so I didn't take it. <laughs> and I basically, um, I had to learn a lot of things by myself. So I'm not a mathematician, but I wish I was, because that's basically what happened every time I go to a conference and they get bombarded by all these mathematician concepts, and they just, I don't get it, right? So what I usually do is that I go home, I watch the talk again, and I still don't get it. And then I watch it again, and I still don't get it. And probably like the third or fourth time, I managed to get it. So I know it's tough, uh, we've all been there, but it's definitely worth it, and it's going to be awesome once you get through all those crazy formulas. So, um, little disclaimer, you don't need category theory to write good Scala code, okay? You can write really good Scala code with no, without knowing anything about category theory. And even more than that, you don't need to know category theory in order to write functional code. Functional principles are pretty basic, and you know, as long as you don't have bars in your code, and you try to avoid side effects, you can still write good functional code. So why am I here on stage talking to you about category theory? Because it's super cool. After you understand category theory, you will have a better view of why we write code the way we do it. Okay? So far, all good? All with me, ready to start with category theory? Yes, awesome. I like this energy. It's telling the morning. <laughs> okay, cool. So the first question is, how do we reason, right? So, for example, as humans, this morning we had to get from the hotel to the venue. So we knew we had to take probably some public transport and then walk a little bit. But while we were doing that, we didn't think about, okay, I need to contract my muscles to 
move my feet and actually get to the drum, right? So even as humans, when we talk, when we reason about things, we usually decompose our tasks in smaller tasks, and we forget all the details that don't matter to us. We know how to walk. We don't have to think, okay, I'm gonna contract my muscles and make the first step, okay? And obviously, when we do computer science, we're trying to translate this way of reasoning into a computer. So, there, it's not a surprise that category theory is a really good fit for doing this, because category theory is the study of how to compose things. It doesn't matter what these things are, we just are interested in how we compose them, okay? Category theory is a little bit of a scary name, so we are in a safe space here, I'm gonna rename it to Haro theory. The reason why I'm gonna rename it Haro theory is because, again, the only thing that we care about are the arrows, means how things interact with each other. We don't actually care too much about what is the, the, the object that we are, uh, that we're using in our interaction. Okay? Good? Awesome. So, what is a category? That is a category. So, um, it's basically two objects. Uh, I'm gonna tell a little bit about what an object actually is, and an arrow that connects two objects together. So, what is an object? Nobody knows. Um, so, it can be whatever we want. And what is an arrow? It's simply something that connects two objects together with a direction, right? So, um, mathematicians have a really tough job, but for us, it's actually quite simple because we work in a really small set of categories, so we know that A and B most of the time are types, and half is probably gonna be a function that takes an argument of type A and then returns a, um, a type B. So we, we have an easy job there, right? But usually mathematicians have to consider every possible case out there. And obviously, um, we have a few rules uh, in our game, otherwise it's not gonna be fun. The first rule is composition. It basically means that if I have an F that goes from A to B, and if I have a G that goes from B to C, I know that I can create a new arrow that is the composition of the two, okay? And the second, um, the second rule of our game is that we always have a row that doesn't do anything, it just returns where we are. We call that identity. So if we compose the identity with any other row, nothing happens, okay? Cool. Last, my favorite rule of our game is composition. I'm not gonna try to read that formula. It basically means that it doesn't matter where we put parentheses, okay? So in more visual terms, it means that the green path is the same as the black one. And why do we do that? because we have better things to do with our life than worry about parentheses, okay? It's just to simplify our life. Cool, so to summarize, the rules of our game are identity, composition, and associativity, yeah? Awesome. Cool, but what, what, what do we care, right? Well, actually, it turns out that we do this all the time, right? So this is a, really small example of a possible category. So for example, you could say that you have a, the set of all the strings and you have a function that converts that string into an int, and then you have another function that converts that string into a boolean. And what we are saying is that if we have a size function that goes from string to int, and we have a bigger than two function that goes from int to bool, we know how to create a new function that is called size bigger than two, right? We, know, we do this all the time in Scala, right? 
And obviously we have an identity. For example, for string, it will be the empty string if the um, composition operation was the function composition, okay? So we do this all the time, Noth nothing new. Cool? Okay, so let's start simple, right? Uh, so uh, we have seen the concept of category, but what is a category with one object? Well, all the rules apply so far. So we have identity, so we have the little ID icon, and then we have arrows that we know we can compose together. And mathematicians sometimes use weird names. Mathematician calls these monoid. But basically monoid is a category with one object. And we still have a set of rules. And these are exactly the same rules that we've seen so far. Identity, composition, associativity. Don't worry about the formulas. Um, turns out that you don't really need to understand them. All you need to do is to copy and paste them and create a Scala check test. Yes, I did it, awesome. Um, so uh, obviously, mathematicians are really precise with their definition. All we need to do is just to copy them and use them in our test to make sure that whatever implementation we are gonna create, it still respects the rules of the game, okay? And uh, Scala check in this example is it's really useful to do that. Um, cool. Um, but again, well, why do we care about monoids? And this is a practical example. So this layer graph is a representation of all the uh, natural numbers. So if we pick operation addition and we say that the uh, identity for this operation is zero, we can basically generate any number. So if we compose one with zero, we still get one back. If we compose zero with one, we still get one back. What if we want to generate a new arrow, let's say four? Well, we can compose the arrow three with the arrow one and we are gonna have a new arrow, four. What if we want to get five? We are gonna compose the new arrow, four, with the arrow one. So you, you get the gist there, right? Um, and it's super cool. Um, and as you can see, composition, identity, and associativity are still respected. But at the end of the day, we are interested about code, right? So this is a possible implementation of what a monoid is in Scala. So what we said is that you basically need an operation that needs to compose the arrows together, and you need to have an identity for that operation. Um, so um, this is a type class, nothing, nothing fancy. Uh, we, we should be pretty used to uh, type classes in Scala. And the way of implementing this type class is just by doing the, the things that we do at work every day, right? So we just implement an instance of this type class. And that will be um, compose, takes two ints, and it sums them together, and the identity is the zero. We could have done it exactly the same, but maybe with a different operation. So for example, we could have picked the multiplication operation. In that case, we would have used the multiplication between ints, and the identity would have been one, right? Same for strings. Um, that is basically the scale implementation of a possible monoid for strings, where the operation is the concatenation between strings, and the identity is the empty string, okay? So nothing fancy there. Uh, you might remember monoid has a way of collapsing things together. But we know what it is, right? We just don't know that it's from category theory. Cool? Awesome. Now let's start with the fun stuff. So we have this beautiful graph. Um, we have this beautiful category. 
um, that has two objects. It has a beautiful flower and it has a triangle. And we have identities for both flower and triangle. And we have an arrow, or probably I should say a function, that transforms a flower into a triangle. Well, what can we do with a category? Um, one of the things that we can do is just map it into another category, right? Um, so the rules of the games are for every object in the source category, you need to have the same object in the target category, but inside the box. And the error needs to be copied as well. So we are basically boxing the objects and copying the arrows, yeah? So again, we have seen the rules. And obviously, we still want to play with categories. It means that our rules, identity, composition, associativity, they still need to be respected. So a way of looking at this is saying, OK, I'm putting my data into a box. So in a way, it's like I am adding some metadata to whatever data I'm working on. So you could think of this as a way of saying, by the way, this is my data, but be careful, because you need to know that there are some special information about this data. And again, we do this in Scala all the time. Options. Option, for example, tells me that the data might or might not be there. List, it tells me that there might be zero copies or multiple copies of that, that, that value. Um, these are other examples that I could think of. Um, you could see try as a box that is about to explode. Or you could see future as a box that it will take some time to be filled in. And the value might not be that great. OK? So this idea of copying a category into a box, mathematicians call it functor. OK, so we are basically adding metadata to our data. OK, and as usual, we have identity, composition, associativity. OK, and we can copy all these rules in a nice color check test that is going to make sure that our implementation is actually still going to respect those rules. OK? Um, but another way of looking at this is saying that if I have a way of transforming a flower into a triangle and I have a box of flower, then I need to know how to transform the box of flower into a box of triangle, right? Because I have all the elements. And um, the way this is translated in code is by another type class uh, that is called a uh, factor. And when we define this type class, we want to tell the um, users of our code, you need to tell me how to do that. So you need to tell me how to define a function map that given a box of A, and a function that transforms an A into a B that returns a box of B. You can think of this as a way of opening the box, look what is inside, and then apply the function to the value that you found inside the box. OK? So just to demonstrate that you don't need any fancy feature of the language to do this, um, I'm going to show you some example implementations. Uh, they're not going to use any standard type from the language, but they are going to use maybe, boom. Uh, it's been inspired by ASCO people, but don't tell them. Um, but it's basically option. So it maybe has two possible values. It's either a just of a value or it has an empty. And the possible implementation for a functor of maybe is 
this. It's just pattern matching over an algebraic data type. So the idea is, if I have my container, maybe, and I open it, and I find nothing, there is much that I can do with it, right? So I just return it. But if I open my box, and I find the value, then I'm just gonna apply the function to the value. Okay? Cool. Um, there are obviously other possible implementations. For example, for list, what you would do, you would do the same, but you will just iterate through all the values that you find in the box and make sure to apply the function to all the elements in the box. Cool? Awesome. So, let's do something a little bit more fun. Um, okay, so we spoke about this idea of having boxes as a way of having metadata about your data. But you could end up with having basically whatever in your box. You could even have a function in your box. So let's assume that you have a box that contains a function that goes from A to B and the box that contains A. You kind of have the intuition that you might be able to somehow combine them together. But remember, what we, the only operation that we are able to do so far is how to open the box. We don't know how to open the box and combine things together. So, um, this idea of opening the box and combining independent boxes together, my mathematician calls it uh, applicative. It's a really scary name. It took me like one year and a half after I started with Scala to get used to it. But, you know, if I did it, it's gonna be fine. You guys will do it too. And um, there are a few more rules, probably too many, but hey, not a problem. Scala check is gonna save us all, right? So we just copy the formulas and Scala check will make sure that whatever implementation we have of our applicative is gonna respect the rules of the game. But the important bit is that, uh, sorry guys, keep a little bit too fast. We have our three amigos up there. There is identity, composition, and associativity. Okay, so it's always the same. Cool? Um, so, um, in order to solve this challenge, we need two operations. We need to, um, well, open the box, we know how to do that, take the values, squash them together, and then put them back in a new box. Okay? And how do we do that in Scala? Type class, again. So for example, um, we can define a pure function that is just the idea of putting the value in a fresh new box. And we can define another function, AP, that is basically combine boxes together. We also need, we still need the concept of opening a box, that it's map. But it turns out that if we have pure and AP, we can implement map using those two. Okay? So that is the definition of an applicative. But obviously, you know, life is not always uh, simple. Uh, so sometimes we have um, function that takes one argument. Sometimes we have function that takes 22 arguments. So what do you do there? It's just more of the same. Instead of opening two boxes, you will have to open 22 plus one, in this example, two plus one boxes. So for that reason, if you guys look at the implementation that we have in our uh, community, either CATS or ScalaZ, you will see that they have a lot of function, AP, AP2, AP3, up to A22. That's just logistics. Okay? And, um, a possible implementation of applicative uh, for maybe is the following. The reasoning behind is that I have my boxes and I open both of them. If in both those boxes I find values, awesome, I smash them together, I apply them together and I put them in a new box. If both of them are empty or any of them are empty, sorry bro, 
there's nothing I can do, right? Uh, so I would just return the empty box. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Awesome, so now the really shocking moment. Okay, box in a box, the thing that everybody talks about. So, this could happen, right? So I have a box, I open it, I find the value, and then uh, for some reason I play a function that returns a box. So I find myself in this weird situation where I have a box in a box of B. And again, the operations that we have so far is open a box, put new things in a new box, and how to <coughs> smash, how to apply different boxes together. We don't know how to get rid of a box. We've never done that. So basically, the problem that we are having now is that we have two boxes, but we want to get rid of one. So believe it or not, mathematicians call this idea of opening a box and get rid of one box or not. So I apologize for, if for any mathematician in the room, sorry. <laughs> but it's basically what it is, right? It's meshing boxes together. Um, yeah, that's it. You guys know what a monad is. Um, and again, we have the three amigos, identity, composition, associativity, that needs to be there. And the formulas are a little bit longer, uh, but still, you can just use Scala check to make sure that whatever implementation you have still respect the rules. Okay? And as you might probably have realized so far, we still have the same pattern that we have seen so far. Type class, implementation, implementation is gonna use pattern matching. It's all the same. Okay, so this is the a possible implementation for a monad in Scala. We still need to be able to open the box, so we still need a functor there, that's why we extend functor. But then we also need to smash things together, right? So we will need a function, let's call it flatten, that given a box of a box, returns a box, okay? And it turns out that this operation of combining boxes together uh, it's fairly common. So in Scala, for example, we have an alias for it that is called flat map. That it basically means apply a map and then do a flatten. Okay? But why people are so excited about monads in general? Uh, because to be honest with you, it's, I mean, functors, yes, is mind blowing when you finally understand what a functor is. It's a great revolution because you are adding layers of metadata to your data, that is really cool. But a monad, smashing boxes together, yeah, it's, yeah, it's cool, but not so cool. Um, so the reason why people are so excited about monad is because it allows you to do a path like, the, like that. So um, given a box of A, you basically have a way of transforming that into a box of B and so on and so forth. You can go to box of C and go to box of D. So basically what Monad allows you is to chain boxes together in sequence. Okay? And again, we do this all the time in Scala, right? Full comprehension, right? That is like lesson one of when you start using Scala is let's learn about full comprehension. The trick is that don't tell us, hey, by the way, you can use a full comprehension because that, that is a monad behind it. They just say, yeah, it's natural, it makes sense. And it actually does make sense, how cool is that? Um, so yeah, um, and now a little bit step ahead. Um, don't worry about it if you get lost. Uh, even the ASCO people uh, took a while to realize this. But it turns out that a monad is actually a little bit more than a functor. Um, in particular, you can implement a monad as an applicative. And how do you do that? Well, again, type classes, right? So if you, if you extend applicative, 
and you uh, leave pure from applicative. There was the idea of putting new values into a new box, and you leave flat map as not implemented. The rest will come from the use of those functions. Okay, so it turns out that every monad is also an applicative. Okay, and again, the implementation is, is really similar to what it, what it was before. Um, that is, I have my box, if I open the box and I have no value, then yeah, the, there is nothing I can do. But if I open my box and I find the value, that's great. I can find my function. I, I, I can use, I can apply my function to the value that I found inside the box. And the pure is the, the same implementation that we have seen for applicative that is just put the value in a just new box. Okay? Everybody with me so far. Cool. And now the sentence that scared me for probably one year and a half. <laughs> monad is the monoid in the category of endofunctors. How many people have heard that sentence before? <laughs> right, everybody. <laughs> okay, but now maybe we can understand what it actually means. Um, so there are two words alighted. Um, the first is monoid, and the second one is endofunctor. And the functor is just a difficult word to just say functor in the perspective of programmers. So if you guys remember, functor was this idea of mapping one category into the other. Um, we work with types and functions, so it turns out that when we talk about programming, we always map the same category to itself, meaning that the source category and the target category are still the same because we still move from types to types. That's basically what endo functor means. Source category and target category are the same. And monoid, we have seen it, has a way of collap collapsing things together where you have an identity and you have a composition function. Yeah? You guys ready for the revolutionary moment? Yes, you are. Okay, so monoid needs to have an identity and needs to have a way of collapsing, collapsing, collapsing things together. So that would be pure and that would be flattened. And then in the functors, we said that it's basically the same as functors for us. Uh, we have a map. So if you guys remember, we have seen two implementation of monads. The first one had map and flatten. There you go. And the second one had pure and flat map. And pure is basically all of, that is basically all of those functions. Okay? Happy? Yes, I was super happy when I learned about this. You guys have no idea. Okay, cool. So, um, a little bit of summary of what we have seen so far. So, category theory is just the study of how things compose. We don't actually care about what those things are as long as we can reason about how, we, how they interact with each other. Um, monoid is just a category with one object and it's extremely useful when we need to collapse things. So for example, when we have to move from a list to a single value. Functor is the real cool thing, is when we are adding metadata to our data, so we are lifting whatever value we are dealing with with a new meaning, like, hey, it could be null. Hey, it could explode any second. Um, applicative is the idea of having independent boxes and combine them together. So you could see this has a lot of independent processing that run in parallel and then gets combined all of them together at the same time, okay? And monads turns out 
that is just operations in sequence in a specific context. So you could see this has a list of operations that happen one after the other, so in sequence. Okay? Cool. But obviously, um, this was just an introduction. There are a lot of things out there that we haven't discussed about and then I don't have a clue about. And this is just an example of all the type classes that have been defining cats. So, um, yeah, we, we barely touched three of them. Um, so, we, we still have a lot of things to learn from mathematicians. Um, but if I want you guys to take something away from this talk, it's this. So, don't care too much about details. Just think about the big picture and how things compose because that is going to make your life a lot easier. So this talk is the result of myself going away and studying a little bit. Um, so these are my favorite resources. If you guys, I managed to get you guys excited about category theory and you guys want to know a little bit more, those are my favorite resources. The first one is a talk by Philip Walden that he did at Lambda World uh, last year, uh, category theory for the working programmer, and uh, it was really good. It goes through the basics. Then Bartosz, obviously, he created a series of videos on YouTube. They are awesome. Uh, but also, he has been uh, writing a blog that is so cool that the community has decided to translate into PDF. So the PDF is open source. You can find it on GitHub. If you guys are interested, let me know and I'll uh, just uh, post it on Twitter. Uh, very super cool. I strongly uh, suggest it to you. And um, the crazy graph of the mapping of all the type classes and cuts that I showed to you, that's from Rob Norris. And Believe it or not, the first place where I started learning about category theory was the CAS documentation. So my suggestion would be to go first through the CAS documentation and then maybe start watching some videos and reading some blog posts. So the great news is that tomorrow at half past three, Bartosz is going to give us a crash course on category theory. So um, we are going to start from where I left, and we are going to see things in a more mathematical way. So hopefully I managed to get you guys excited about this. So, code, because guys, I managed to implement this by myself. How cool is that? The code is on GitHub. Uh, feel free to go and have a look and create PR saying, hey, actually, there is a better way of doing this. Um, I'll post the slides on Twitter, and if you guys want any uh, advice on what kind of resources uh, I found useful during my journey of discovery of category theory, I would be more than happy to answer any questions. Um, so that was me. Uh, I think, yeah, that was a little bit quicker than I expected. Uh, but thank you very much, guys, for, uh, for listening to me. Do you guys have any questions? Yes. Okay, can you talk a little bit about angular functors, what do they do? They are exactly the same as functors. So in terms of, if we, uh, if we think again of, uh, about the metaphor of opening a box, they still open a box. But mathematicians have to consider a lot of different categories, right? We are extremely lucky because as programmers, we actually only work on a specific set of categories. That is, objects are types, and arrows are functions. So, um, and the functors are, um, are functors where the source category and the target category are the same. If we go back and look at, I'll get to it, yes. Okay, it basically means that this category, this drawing of flower and triangle and that drawing of box, flower, box, triangle, 
they all belong to the same category. That in, for us programmers, it means the category of types and functions. So it's just a scary word, really. Uh, if you're really confused, just use functors and hope that a mathematician is not gonna hear to what you're saying, but that should, that, that worked for me for a while. Uh, cool. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Sorry. At the beginning of your mm -hmm. talk, you say one category comprises not only one object, it may cover it. Yes. And I was wondering what would be the name of the category that, uh, that, uh, that uh, comprises more objects. Okay, so the question is, a monoid is a category with only one object. What happens if, how do you call a category that more, has more than one object? I would say category, <laughs> but probably I'm looking at Bartosz if there is a, a better name, but uh, as far as I know, uh, in terms of size, the only one that is particular is the one where we have only one object, and that would be monoid. <laughs> if you have two objects, three objects, four objects, as many objects as you want, it's a category. So there is no special name for it. Yes? Uh, so the, the question is, I'm confused. So I thought that these two uh, were categories, two different categories, uh, but now you're saying that because we are programmers, actually it's still the same? Yes, exactly that. So the idea of adding metadata, you add metadata through a type. So I didn't know how to draw that, but in theory, yes, you're right. Because we are programmers, it means that we are special. Um, this is one category. So by adding metadata, you still are in the same category of types because you do that through types. I'm happy to, to have a talk about it because it, it took me a while as well. But don't worry, it took me months. So if you don't get it in five minutes, it's, it's normal. Any other question? Okay, so for the recording, the question is where those crazy names come from? Um, and the answer is I don't know. Uh, I, believe it or not, I spent five years of my life uh, studying Greek, and I know that mono means one. So monoid kind of it probably makes sense, but probably this is a question more for Bartosz. I'm not sure what monads, why the word monads where it comes from, but, but I guess there, there must be some reason. We just don't know what it is because we're not mathematicians. <laughs> uh, Bartos, do you happen to know why they're called that way? So probably a monad is called monad because it's a monoid, so they, they use the, the first part <laughs> as the same. Um, cool. Um, I'm afraid I'm out of time, so if you guys want to ask me more questions, I'll be around. But thank you very much, guys, for your attention. Hopefully it was useful. And don't forget to attend Barso's talk tomorrow. House Plus Free is going to be an awesome follow-up to this talk. Okay? Thank you, guys. Thank you.